everybody and welcome to Alan History Nerd. In this video I'm going to look at 1905 in Tsarist Russia, looking at the events of Bloody Sunday and the 1905 revolution. This is part of my playlist on Tsarist and Communist Russia going all the way through from 1851 to 1964. So check that playlist out on my channel. As I add to it, it's well worth subscribing because I'm on to Nicholas II at the moment. I've done Alexander II and Alexander III, and I'm going to keep on adding, so eventually we should have the entire specification on there. Right, so let's crack on with 1905. We are looking at this key question in the spec, how was Russia governed and how did political authority change and develop? Uh, I've already done a video on political authority, government and the Tsar, and again there are going to be separate videos on some of these other elements. The bit we're concentrating on today is the 1905 revolution. The starting point is Bloody Sunday. So one of the organisations that have been created under this idea of police socialism, this idea where, where the state actually get involved in, uh, and, and allow a, a controlled way of the workers venting their frustrations and asking for, for control um, was the assembly of Russian factory workers and this was led by a Russian Orthodox priest, uh, Father Georgi Gapon. Now following the defeat of the Russian forces at Port Arthur in December 1904, tensions in St Petersburg really started to boil over, they came to a head. Uh, and the workers at, at the Putov Ironworks went on strike on the 3rd of January 1905. Now, Father Gapon, he, he, I mean, he had connections with the Okhrana. He, he, he obviously was the connections with the Russian Orthodox Church. This isn't really a guy who's desperate to, to overthrow uh, the Tsarist system. Uh, and, but he led a demonstration of 150,000 workers and their families. And again, it's worth noting that this isn't just workers. This is their, them, their wives, their kids. This is a peaceful demonstration. He led the, this demonstration to St. Petersburg to present a petition to the Tsar at the Winter's Palace. Now, many of the eight demonstrators carried uh, icons of the Tsar to show their loyalty to him. I mean, th this is uh, one of the odd bits to get because we've seen the, how the repression and, and the, the incompetence and stuff of, uh, of the Tsarist regime. But the, these people, they, they believed that bad stuff was happening because the Tsar didn't know about it, that the Tsar could actually take their side and sort it out that this stuff wasn't his fault and that he as their little father would be on their side because that was his job as czar now he he was not actually in the palace at the time but he'd left 1200 troops in the city uh, to to kind of keep control as the crowd marched towards the uh, Winter Palace, the soldiers stationed there became increasingly nervous. As they, the crowd edged even closer, the troops actually opened fire on these unarmed civilians. Now, whether this was started by the actions of a nervous soldier or direct orders from, uh, from the, those in charge is not fully clear. It, it's difficult to know precisely how many were killed or wounded. I mean, the Tsarist government claims it was uh, 76 that were killed. But a lot of historians have put the death toll much closer to a thousand. Obviously, there's an enormous discrepancy in there. And again, this is something historians argue about, that the official records argue about. So it's a it's a big number, I think, it is the key bit on this. So this massacre of peaceful protests on Bloody Sunday in St. Petersburg, it, for many people, it is the final straw. Um, they, they've now started to say, well, actually, maybe the Tsar isn't on our side maybe isn't our little father isn't um going to protect us and 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 the only way that the lives of these russian people is going to get any better is through revolution and so they start to listen more to to the revolutionary groups and then there's a whole wave of violence and unrest that follows us that's swept through the country and this is called the 1905 revolution now there's a whole range of causes uh, for this we we've we've got the starting point which is bloody sunday we've got the trigger which is is the russia japanese war but we've got a lot of long-term causes as well i mean part of this goes back to the fact that nicholas ii is refusing to reduce his autocratic powers he's, un he's unwilling to allow representation uh, representative of the people such such as exempts to influence government policy 
it goes back to, to, to stuff I've looked at in previous videos. Nicholas himself it isn't actually capable, and he doesn't, I don't even believe himself he was capable of ruling Russia effectively and resolving uh, many, many of the problems that he faced, but he wouldn't allow representative groups, the Zemstvers, others, to, to actually help him do it. Um, the long-term failures, going all the way back to Alexander II, of emancipation to bring about genuine improvement in the lives of the peasantry, is also a, a real underlying problem here. So the peasants still bore great resentment against the nobility, who they perceived as, as continuing to exploit them. Uh, and a big, a big example of this is through things like uh, uh, redemption payments. The demonstrations of 1903, 1904, the years of the Red Cockerel, with the, all the arson and the burning of all... Uh, of all the grain houses and, and, and even um, the, uh, some aristocratic homes and stuff, <coughs> showed, showed that th there was a lot of control in the countryside. Now, some of the socioeconomic change is also really important in all of this, because there was a growing ur urban proletariat, working class, due to industrialization. And they flooded into the towns and cities and they faced horrendous overcrowding, poor and poor living conditions. Again, this is the perfect breeding ground for, for opposition and revolution. Uh, and because the population here is very densely populated, it's much easier to spread those ideas and to get people to act collectively. Uh, in 1904, there were 90,000 strikes. Again, if you compare this to the uh, to just 10 years earlier, it's a gigantic increase. And a lot of these um, strikes, it's not just people striking, the, the, these turn into violent clashes between workers and the police. And behind all of this, we've got radical groups such as socialist revolutionaries and social democrats who are, who are, are, are pushing uh, revolutionary ideas. We've seen the attempt uh, through police socialism to way of uh, kind of trying to meet, steering, steering the workers away from these radical groups and, and trying to, to get them to see that they can talk to authorities and, and, and maybe things will uh, happen and things will improve. But that experiment had largely been ab abandoned um, and Zubatov, who, who was behind it all, had been dismissed and Nicholas again became uh, a lot more uh, reactionary. So, and, and we, we saw again where we got one of these organisations that linked to that idea of police socialism under Gapon. We've seen that and what happens to that in the, uh, in the events of Bloody Sunday. So the spark, well, one spark is the absolute real begin, beginning of, and, it, and where it all then goes for it, it is Bloody Sunday, which looked at earlier in the video. But the, the kind of the, the, the spark behind that is is the uh, the Russia-Japanese war. I mean, this was supposed to be an easy victory. It, it, it was supposed to be a unifying thing. The war, the idea was that this war would draw the Russian people together and give them a sense of unity against a foreign enemy. But instead, it proved an absolute disaster. Again, it showed the failings of the Tsarist regime. It brought death and it brought suffering to the Russian people. And it was humiliating. They, they'd been defeated by a much smaller power, um, which the regime had produced propaganda showing, claiming it were, they were racially inferior and all that kind of nonsense. And, and what we're seeing here is, is real evidence that Tsarism was damaging Russia's standing in the world rather than, than helping it. And, and, and again, showing it was falling behind other powers, not just the great powers like of Britain and France and, 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 and Germany, but it was it was falling behind Japan and, and other powers as well, and therefore was quite vulnerable. And again, this sparks the idea of lots of people in Russia that there is a need for change. And, and this can be the really radical groups, and this will be a lot more moderate groups who are just going, we just need to change the way that this is run. And so you see liberal opposition as well. So the events uh, of 1905, I'm going to concentrate on different groups as I go through this. To start off, we've got the workers. So f in February 1905, there's 400,000 workers on strike in St. Petersburg. Uh, there's been illegal trade unions set up all over the place, uh, and this brought a, wide, a wave of strike action across all parts of the Russian Empire. In April and May 1905, we've seen these workers' councils known as Soviets, which are going to be really important in our story going forward, that were set up. And they started to seize control of factories. In October, a general strike was called, and they saw two and a half million workers across Russia go on strike. Um, and it, it, this basically caused the economy to collapse, particularly the strike of railway men, which meant that goods couldn't be transported around this vast empire. And so things are really starting to tell. 
Uh, and in, in October, again, 1905, we see the workers of St. Petersburg form a council or Soviet of workers' deputies to try and coordinate all of this. So it's gone from kind of the odd disorganised but, but fairly large and violent strike to proper organisation amongst the workers. This is a real threat to the Tsarist regime. The countryside really isn't any better. I mean, there were thousands of disturbances all over the country and there was more burning and seizing of property uh, by the peasants of the landowning class. Uh, and the, the, some of the localised peasant revolts grew into more widespread up, uh, uprisings across the whole um, region. Uh, we see this in, in the Kursk region in, in February uh, and, and what, uh, what are known as the Black Earth regions uh, of Russia war in, in revolt by, by April. In in May, it was an episode set up an old Russian peasant union. Uh, it was made at a congress in Moscow. And again, so we're seeing the peasantry starting to be organised and, and, and revolutionary groups behind that. Um, in August, this peasant union becomes better established and it, it's heavily influenced by one of our opposition groups again, which I'll, I'll look at in, in other videos, the socialist revolutionaries. Another area which another group who had suffered greatly under the, the Tsarist regime, particularly Alexander III and then continued under Nicholas II, were the different national minorities and, and ethnic groups throughout Russia. And many of them seized the, um, the opportunity in 1905 to try and gain greater autonomy. And, and, and uh, we see major strikes in Polish cities such as Warsaw and Lotz uh, and, and running battles between uh, Polish workers and Russian troops as Poland again tries to assert a degree of independence. Uh, general strike in October in Finland resulted in greater autonomy being granted to the Finns again. Uh, in, in Estonia, we've got the All Estonian Congress eight, with 800 represented demanding official acceptance of the Estonian language and greater autonomy. In Latvia, thousands of local fish, officials demanded greater powers of self-government. In February, uh, the, the Jewish population formed the Union uh, for the Attainment of Equal Rights for Jews and, and thousands and thousands of Jews joined the unrest across Russia. And again, these have been particularly badly treated by the Black Hundreds under Nicholas II and, 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 and the pogroms uh, that continued under Nicholas II and uh, had, had, had been happening under uh, Alexander III as well. And even in, in, in the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, there were demands for a Ukrainian assembly. So we really do get the impression of, of, of the Russian uh, Empire being torn apart at the seams and completely collapsing uh, with all this going on in all these different places. Things got even worse uh, if, in, in another aspect, really, because the, the, the one bit that the Tsarist regime is reliant on, uh, because it's a repressive regime, is on its military. Uh, and, and in May 1905, the Kronstadt uh, naval base near, uh, near um, the um, St. Peter's ro rose up against their officers. In, in June, uh, the battleship Potemkin, uh, which was based in the Black Sea, mutinied and, and, and the crew seized control of their ship. The army, thankfully for, for the Tsar, Ray, remained largely loyal, but a, a lot of people were away fighting um, the Japanese. And again, there were some small mutinies uh, within army units. So if the, the Tsar can't even be sure of military support, he really is in a very, very weak position. Now, the result of this is going to be um, the October Manifesto, because the, the system seems to be at a complete collapse. Um, the Tsarist ministers told him that without reform, then he, he, his regime is going to be swept away in revolution. And there goes 300 years of Russian history. And these ministers included Sergei Vitt, uh, uh, Trepov, a, and the uh, Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich Romanov. He actually threatened to shoot himself unless there was some kind of reform put in place. And this led to the October Manifesto. And again, in, 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 in another, another video, the next video I do, I'm going to go into the details of the October Manifesto uh, and the system that it sets up. And we'll look at the fundamental laws and we'll look at the doomers. But what we see at the end of 1905 is the Tsar essentially having to bring in some kind of reform. Not because he wants to reform, but because his hands are forced by the events of the 1905 revolution. 
Thank you very uh, uh, much uh, for watching. Please uh, remember to like, share with anybody else you think would find this useful and to subscribe to receive um, notifications and updates and to see all the new stuff that I put on. There's a whole range of stuff on uh, Russian history, the stuff on other areas of history uh, as well, including uh, the Tudors and modern Britain. And there is uh, also loads and loads of stuff on here on A-level politics, if that's something else that you're interested in. So thank you very much for watching. Um, Please subscribe.